construction. If you grasp this, that this revolutionized my approach to these first five books. When I saw it wasn't the kind of external imposition of some intolerable law from above, but it was meant to be teaching. Where, in a sense, Adonai, the Lord, in a very, very dark world, chose a particular people who would be penetrated by his teaching, and that they, in turn, would live as a model people. Now, the history of Israel reflects, you know, as that word penetrated, there was often rebellion, there was often hardness. And the more I read the history of Israel, the more I read, that's me. Because as, as the word of God penetrates, there's bits of you wants to rebel, and there's bits of things you don't want to give up. So this was, you know, Israel was meant to be the light of the nations, the one through whom God would, would speak to the nations. So Torah is a remarkable teaching tool, and because you know the, the Lord is such a remarkable teacher, He says, "I'm going to teach you through the food you eat and through the clothes that you wear." We'll talk maybe a little bit about kosher later on, but the, the clothes that they wear. Now, this garment, obviously now a talit, a prayer shawl, is an individual and a separate garment. But remember, in the ancient world, where you would have been wearing long, flowing garments, the Lord said to his people, I want you to attach tassels to your garments. Now this wasn't a new idea. It wasn't unique to Israel, because there's evidence that goes back at least 3,000 years to civilizations like a people called Mari, M-A-R-I, the ancient Egyptians, can show you some pictures, where they would have had tassels on their garments. And this became almost in the ancient world the ID of the individual wearer. And the more important you wear, the longer the tassel would be. So an ancient Akkadian in the Nari society, you know, if you wanted to, today we'd maybe drive a Porsche, we wear designer labels. They extended their tassels. And where clay tablets, you know, where a lot of communication was done, a lot of business was recorded on clay tablets, these could have been knotted and then used to press into the clay, and that became your signature. It's like a forerunner of what we call a signature or a signet ring. This was your signet. <coughs> There's evidence to suggest that if a woman got married, or was married and then was divorced, symbolically, the tassel would have been cut off from her garment. This tassel was a natural extinct extension of the owner and of the wearer. So this was used. Now this is where you see in a sense, the Lord is an absolutely masterly teacher. He now takes these over and says, I'm going to use them, in Israel's case, as a particular teaching device, where when you look at these, you will then remember my Torah, my teaching. So as Michael was saying, you know, when you'll see them, see Jewish men at airports, who are wearing an external light, the idea is when you look down, you see that there are three verbs that are used in, in the text. When you look, you remember, and you do. So when you look, you see something that's in an ancient tradition and very highly symbolic. Now, just studying this helps us understand a few passages in, in the scripture. Do you remember when David, um, David was on the run from Saul and he hides in a cave at En Gedi. Now unfortunately we're not going to get to En Gedi on this trip but they have to come back, don't they? They must come to En Gedi. And up, the, up in Gedi and we will go swimming. But remember David was hiding in a cave. Now the English versions are so, so 
life. They will say he went in to relieve himself. The Hebrew version says that he had his garments gathered round his loins. Sorry, Saul, so, I beg your pardon, I'm getting, I'm jumping ahead of my Saul went into the cave that David was hiding in. And Saul had his garments gathered round his loin. So Saul was concentrated. And in the darkness, David was deep in the cave, and David was able to sneak up behind Saul, and it says that he cut off the hem of his garment. And in the West, we're sitting thinking, how can anybody cut around the bottom of my coat, and I wouldn't know it? We think in terms of, you know, Marks and Spencer's best double stitching. But what if you're in a very, very dark, almost a darkness you can feel, you're concentrating, and maybe the tassel's hanging over a rock behind you, and David comes up behind with a very sharp knife, and off comes. The citizen. Because a few verses later on, we read that Saul sees David, and David holds up the zitzit. And Saul immediately says, surely one day you will be king of Israel. There's a prophetic note there, but is it also tied to the fact that he was holding the symbol of the king's authority? Something that had been very uniquely, very personally, Saul's. You see the sense it makes? And in the ancient world, there was also a tradition that if you wanted to petition somebody for something, you would come and you would touch and hold on to the zitzits. Now your mind's way ahead, isn't it? Because now you know, when that woman who'd been hemorrhaging for so long, pushed through the crowds with chutzpah, <coughs> with a cheeky, cheeky boldness. And she reached out to touch. We sing the hem of his garment. What she was reaching out to touch was the zitzit that Yeshua would have been wearing. Because Yeshua would have been wearing these as a, you know, as a Torah observant, synagogue attending, Galilean villager, he would have been wearing zitzits. David Flusser, who died not so long ago, is a world-famous Jewish scholar. He was the leading Jewish authority on the New Testament, and he taught it for many years in the uh, Hebrew University. And actually, on radio, there's, is there still, there's a, a radio station here just devoted to the education of the army. When you join the army here, it's, it's part of a huge educational program. <coughs> And uh, soldiers, young people are taught about their heritage. And David Flusser used to teach, and he would teach about the New Testament from, you know, a Jewish perspective. And Flusser, in the course of those programs, said, there is not one single shred of evidence that Jesus ever broke any commandment of the Torah. So, we knew he would have been wearing this because it was commanded in the Torah. So when that woman reaches out to touch, then she's been incredibly bold, exercising incredible faithness, faithfulness. But now, correct me on this, Michael, because I have read and I've heard said these this would have been regarded as very personal, you, you know, and very tight. So, for somebody like that woman to reach out and touch them, this was something that normally only the owner would do, or a very close member of his family would, do, would be to touch them. So, it's as if this woman was assume, assuming, if we can put it in its original sense, she was being familiar with Jesus, in the sense that she expected him to treat her as part of his familia, his family. 
that he, she wasn't going to be rejected. So it was a wonderful kind of bold statement, confident statement. Here she's coming, ostracized, but believing she would not be rejected. So when you look at this, and you look, and you remember its richness, but then the third verb is do. Because incredibly important to Hebrew thought is not just knowing, it is doing. And often Hebrew thought, when you can begin to compare it with Greek thought, it's often put in the pithy little saying, for the Hebrew, deed is more important than creed. Not that creed is unimportant, but that, well, as Shammai once, when the Shammai said, do much, but say that. And Shammai, a contemporary of Jesus, a contemporary of Halev, do much, say that. And the model for that teaching was based on Abraham. Because they said when Abraham received the three guests, he said, wait here, I will go and get you some bread. But what did he do? He didn't pop down to spar for a loaf. Wait here, I'll get you some bread. But he went and he arranged for the calf to be killed. Uh, a feast. So he said little, but he did much. And they ended up getting a whole feast. So Shumai says it's so important. Say little. But do much. I mean, that's an incredible lesson still to this day. When you read, and that's why I encourage you to have a wee look when you go home, even online, or you may see them in the bookshops in Jerusalem, the ethics of the fathers. There's so much that we can learn. I, I, there's another saying of Hillel I didn't mention yesterday, and to me it's, a, it's an incredibly rich one, where uh, Hillel says, If I am not for me, then who will be for me? But if I am only for me, then it's a problem. Now, do you see what he's saying? If I am not for me, if I let others kind of shape me and mold me, if I live my life, if you live your life, really letting it be shaped by what you other people think you should be, what I'm expected to be, then I become a kind of a chameleon. I'm all things to all people. I have no self-identity. I have no real worth. I've got to understand who I am before God. Now that's not the same as pride. But at the same time, we've got to understand, and, and sometimes it, it, it concerns me deeply, that we've kind of an approach to life in, in some Western churches where we think, Humility is the same as being a sort of having a worm theology. I'm never good enough, I'm never giving enough, I'm never praying enough, I'm just a hopeless worm, I have nothing to offer, and then we think that's humility. You know, that's self-degradation. Humility, as one great teacher, and he just died a few weeks ago, very tragically, he is a He's a Gentile, but I encourage you, you can get his teaching now online. It's called White Choir. And he came to faith in, in Yeshua and had a, an incredible experience. And he's some of the best teaching I've ever heard. You can get it and download it online. But Dwight puts it wonderfully when he says humility. Humility is not thinking less of yourself. Humility is thinking more of God. So thinking more of God doesn't mean that I have to denigrate myself. I have to deprecate myself. I don't have to make myself a worm. But I understand who God is. And remember how that says if we are in the image of God, if we, we polish the statue of the, the emperor, well think of the dignity that we have and the gifts that God's given us. Think of the incredible gifts, the diversity, even within this small world. So we don't let others kind of define us or categorize us. 
If I am not for me, if I don't have a sense of who I am before God, humbly before God, then who else is going to define me? But then on the other hand, if I am only for me, if it's all about I and me, then you end up with the I and the me and the other. Because it's all about the satisfaction of self. And it's purely selfish. And that's not an answer either. So there's an incredible wisdom and in almost the basics, a psychologist will tell you, the basis for good, healthy, emotional and spiritual life uh, embedded in the teaching of, of many of these Pharisees. But, you see, we do. Obedience is very important in Hebrew thought. That we obey, we walk out. And, and I mean, do you see how thoroughly Hebraic and Pharisaic Yeshua was? If you love me, you will obey me. It's doing. It's the life of, of, of obedience. And there is a tradition now, this is not in the scriptures, but I find it very, very rich. And Michael, keep me right on this one. By the way, how many commandments are there? Where? Two. Very good, a very good answer. But yes, for one, for two, but no. Some will say ten. But in Jewish tradition, when you count from Genesis through to Deuteronomy, you get 613. Now, there's a very, very ancient rabbinic tradition that when they counted the bits and pieces of your body, do you know how many bits and pieces make us up? 613. Now, now guide me in this matter. Is it the numerical value of the word for sitzit? Is it? There's something. No, it's the number of knots. It's the number of knots that are made in each of the four. Uh, the way it's wound around. 13, 12, 10, and 8. So it's the number of knots. And then you add up the knots. All four corners, you need to see some of This is supposed to remind us. Yes. So, now look at this for a visual teaching. Every morning, as a man takes his talit, he said, I am wrapping every one of, every part of my body in every one of your now can you begin to understand how I love your Torah. It is sweeter than honey. It is more precious than gold. You see, you don't say that about law. We don't, we don't waltz down the street. Oh, Lord, thank you for those wonderful laws. You see those 30 miles speed so laws. I thank you for those. Lord, thank you for that double yellow line. How the laws delight my soul. No, oh, they're kids than I. For most of us. So, but when you say, how I love your guidance, your direction, your Torah, you see the powerful um, beauty of that. Over against a, an incredibly kind of negative view of the law. So that, you know, there's an incredible symbolism of this. A boy will be given this at 13, and very often then will be actually very So this is the richness of, you know, the tradition that's in this. Any, any questions or anything? Because here's a wonderful opportunity to ask when you're Michael as, as, as well. So does each man may 